Hey everybody and okay, welcome good. to Business TV today with Chris Wilson who is a sales coach with Adamo um, basically owner director of Adamo business consultants coaching training and all the rest of it and amazingly he is also a bit of an endurance runner and it's uh, in his bio that he sent us he says that he ran 130 kilometers in a day wow how many miles is that uh, it's about 90 yeah Gee, jesus christ have you not got a car chris <laughs> but at the end of the day more importantly what he is going to talk to us about is how people go wrong in their sales process how he stops the linkedin lead from going cold and a, a lot about habits and i'm quite looking forward to the habit stuff because i think that's a very interesting subject anyway so uh, so hello chris happy new year thank you very much delighted to be here thank you Good stuff, good stuff. So I, I reckon, first of all, let's get this 90 mile bloody run out of the way. Yeah. What was that? What, how, how did you, what did you just go out one day and go, you know what, I think I'm going to run. I think, I think I'll run to York and back or something. Oh, it's more than York and back, mate. It's, uh, it's, it's Harrogate back, Harrogate, from, from my house in York to Harrogate about four times. So in a day. How many times is it across? How, 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 how far is it from, from like, Blackpool to the other side. Oh, I think that's a, that's about 150. I think, yeah. Bloody hell! So, oh god, it's halfway. Yeah, the, the story of that is that I'm in a coaching uh, group, and my mate in Australia, Patrick, who was also an Ironman, we both kind of spar off each other. Said, "I'm doing this 100 miles in a day challenge around an athletics track," and I was like, "Hmm, that sounds interesting. Tell me more." So he told me about it, and I said, "Right, I think I'm going to do it." around my village because we're in lockdown so uh my village circuit is about two miles so i said april the 17th when he was doing his i'll do it you do it in australia i'll do it in england we'll check in with each other and we'll both have an accountability buddy so 10 o'clock at night on the 17th of april i set off and just kept on running so you run through the night yep we started at 10 o'clock and then i had a buddy come down at midnight so we did two hours with each other we'd done a a marathon by five o'clock in the morning uh and then another buddy came down about half past five for sunrise uh and then just i didn't run the whole time i have to confess i, I did walk because some people coming down and they didn't want to run so i just walked uh, i shuffled uh but yeah we raised just under two thousand pounds for mind wow. and pancreatic wow. cancer amazing because i did it because my dad uh, lost his life from pancreatic cancer and the charity that i was doing it with uh, Mark Byrne, he lost his wife through pancreatic cancer. So that was kind of connecting to my purpose. And I wanted to kind of suffer a little bit for the suffering that my dad went through. And it was just my tribute to him, really. Yeah. Brilliant. How much weight did you lose? Did I, you I, a lot. Uh, yeah. I, I, my afternoon was I was extremely delirious, extremely hallucinogenic. Uh, and it was a bit weird. There's a parts of the afternoon that I cannot remember. I know my sister came up, surprised me, uh, and, and she said I was literally just all over the place because I just got my nutrition wrong at a certain point. And once you lose your nutrition, yeah. when you're in a very big challenge, yeah. you, you know, the, the curve is very, very deep, steep and downwards, and you it's very hard to get it back. So it was more of a, a war of attrition of the mind as opposed to necessarily the, uh, the physical aspects. See, I find cider does a similar thing to me. <laughs> <laughs> Makes me makes me forget things and slightly delirious. And uh, well, maybe we should try. There is a running challenge <laughs> where you have to um, run a mile, drink a pint, run a mile, drink a pint, and it, somebody's done something like uh, the five mile challenge in forty minutes or something whilst drinking every mile. The, the, it, you Google it. Wow. There's a there's a beer challenge where you run a mile, drink a mile, run a mile, drink a mile, and the times that they do is you just think, how do they do that? Not just the alcohol impacts but the physical sloshing around of oh yeah beer. see we used to, when i was in the army we didn't put the running in we did the beer challenges so like eight pints in an hour it was called the pig and the dinosaur was 10 pints in an hour so that i never did a dinosaur i did a pig but i never did a dinosaur 
But yeah, oh my <laughs> word, right, right. Move, well, move, move, and it, and, uh, but yes, that, that is very impressive and incredibly uh, uh, well. Good of you for the fact that you raised the money. But there is a link to wow. business because business, we all go on a journey. Yeah, we have a goal, yeah. and you have to break the goal back down to its component parts and chunk right. it. If you try to do 130 kilometers just straight off without any planning, preparation, nutrition, or habits then yeah. you would you wouldn't achieve it so there is a link to why yeah. an endurance challenge has an association with planning your business journey well exactly so your sales training then because i know we, we gareth and i have both been on your um, your friday uh, is it first friday of the month first friday uh, of the month first yeah, friday we do a month. sales q a yeah yeah the sales q a which is we've both raved about and been a couple of times um because they are very good but would you you do a lot more training with people making them understand basically more about their potential clients and how to engage with them so do you want to tell us a bit more about that that'd be good yeah the model i would normally uh, use is is the is the ada principle uh, which is uh, which is meaning that all of us when we're going through a buyer's journey will go through four stages and the first of all is that they need to become aware of you so we are aware now that clockwork i exists as a brand uh, because of something that gareth has done but at that stage we've got absolutely no compulsion to buy from gareth because he's just a brand so gareth has to do something to make me interested my brain has to switch on to his message whether he's providing a testimonial third-party proof an amazing offer something that he says does or somebody tells me about that makes me interested in his brand that's part of the marketing funnel at the top and then it basically chucks them over the fence to say i'm now not necessarily a prospect i'm a buyer and then we kick into sales mode where we have to work on the d of the ada model which is desire so i've now got to work with you as the prospect to make you want to make a decision to purchase and then we do the a which is action so that's the four step methodology and if you try to do the desire and action bit without me being interested in you as a uh, persona then you're literally going to start to uh, actually become quite annoying because you're trying to get me to listen about return on investment or how many times i'm going to improve your sales funnel and i haven't actually yet clued in to the emotional part of why i want to buy from you yeah, yeah. yeah. so that's a lot of what i start to talk about and then we break that down through all the different parts, marketing, and then a lot of time spent on the D bit, which is the desire bit. How do we get somebody to take the decision to buy from you, either through working on where they're suffering through pain, or more importantly, where they want to get to? So by fixing this, what does it allow them to do in the future? Yeah. And how do they get that message across to their prospect? Oh, it's, it's, uh, it, it... It all makes perfect sense when you break it down like that. I think a lot of time, where I, me personally, I'm not. I don't see myself as a salesperson, um, and I always give too much away. I'm, I'm rubbish like that. I always give too much away. But then people say to me, "No, well, no, that's why I wanted to work with you." And I'm like, I don't even realize I'm doing sometimes. Well, we're all day. selling. Even if you looked at the blind date situation, the first thing you do when you go to the bar, you don't say, "Hey, uh, should we go upstairs and uh, you know crack on." Of course, yeah, that's, that's going to be unsuccessful. You build rapport, you ask questions, you find common interest, you find things that you can both talk about. And then that creates trust and understanding, which then leads you to more emotional parts of that dating process. But if you go in too fast, too soon, then they're just going to find you creepy or lecherous or annoying, and they'll walk out the bar. So we are selling all the time in life, but sometimes we forget the same process to how we engage our customers and hey linkedin who doesn't get the linkedin message that says can you connect with me and then boom you connect and they pitch at you straight away and that's a classic example of how people don't understand the way that you build value and rapport that then could lead to a conversation way way down the line but that's the linkedin process yeah. where they get it completely wrong with building trust and rapport do you think yeah. that's, I've, I've had a few of those recently from uh, America um, where they've been linked in with people that I know. So I've connected with them and then suddenly the Americans have come firing back at me, which I immediately disconnect with them. Do you think it's a cultural thing or do you think it's a it's a just a, the, the way they are? I, I, I've got it from UK. I've got it from all over the world. I think there's a lot of people peddling this message at the moment that LinkedIn is an incredible platform. And it is. I'm not denying that. But it, like everything, we, we become sheep because 
the guru or the thought leader somewhere says this is the way that you're going to exponentially 10x your business and they've either been instructed wrong or they've missed the whole modeling experience yeah. Yeah. and they've got that you know they're taking a shortcut because they haven't really gone to the full extent of the knowledge share that they should be yeah yeah it makes perfect sense because one of the we had a guest on recently who does social media and one of the things that she said is that whenever you go on either reply to somebody's post or post and how many people just go on and browse and then leave that's not using the platforms effectively. I mean, you say about people getting in touch. I once had somebody <clears throat> get in touch with me with a little bit of uh, about what they do and stuff, and I'd love to connect. Now, I always reply to people. This is an idea I actually stole off Gareth, um, but I, I, I was in a position to actually make it. But I always reply saying, hey, thanks for the connect. Here's a video. Uh, instead of a load of waffle, here's a video about me explaining what we do at Cockroach Guy. Yeah, and I put a video link in to my reply because we do video. That's what we do. Um, I once had a guy connect with a, this is what I do. Would you like to connect? And I replied with my thing and he replied, what do you mean waffle? I was just trying to tell you what I was saying. And I said, Re so I replied, reread my comment, my, my reply, and then apologize. Um, and, and he didn't, he didn't even come back to me at all. Now, it could have been a really good way for him to start up a conversation saying, oh, Christ, dear, sorry about that. I misread your statement. Did, you're not waffling. And we could have had a bit of rapport. But well, there's a great thing there about the, the, the importance of written communication. So there's a, a guy called Albert Mahabrian who talks about the effectiveness of communication. And yeah. if, you, if you use the written word, it's about 7% effective yeah. because the way you write it is the way that they read it but it's not necessarily the way that you meant it that's right whereas if you then step it up a little bit to put a uh, voice into that it then increases so you get about 35 percent effectiveness just by adding a voice intonation and also you can ask questions and then if you actually face to face that's when you get the full range of the whole experience of 100 percent effectiveness that's right uh, so my message to anybody is if you're trying to get something particularly complicated relying on the written word is never going to be as good as just stepping it into a voice conversation uh, or adding a voice note. Voice notes are fantastic on social to be able to add a voice note, how you can add authenticity, emotion, meaning and clarification to get that uh, to get that to resonate. You, with you use these a lot now, don't you? I, I've had a couple from you um, of voice notes through yeah. LinkedIn. Yeah, and they're so quick. You know, I mean, I can pick up, hey, Gareth, nice to see you today. It's great Bloody working easy. with you. And uh, by the way, if you don't know how to do it, go to your message. There's a little tiny microphone icon to the right of where you'd normally type hold that down you can record the message and then bang it's gone yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it, it's it's very clever. fire out you know 50 well not 50 but 10 voice notes in the first 10 minutes of your day and you've automatically created yeah. 10 conversations with people very it, quick. It, it is very clever I mean, gareth and i were looking at it for the interactive networking uh, that we run at the end of the month last Friday of the month one o'clock till two o'clock plug in um, that basically we, we we do and we get a lot of people who accept our invites um, and I was saying to Gareth we, we need to use this voice interactivity to basically communicate with them because we'll get better responses first of all it is fairly new and like anything new people go well I've got a voice message on LinkedIn what's that about and they listen to it you know it's uh it, it's it's very clever and it is better but like you say one of the things that i tell people is when we when we're doing filming is 94 percent of communications through body language you know mm. that the, there's a you can tell your friend to go away in no uncertain terms and you can either get, get a smack in the mouth or you can get a laughter because of the body language that we use you know and the way we communicate like you say written word is awful for communication yeah which is why social media are there are so many arguments on social media absolutely but also don't make it perfect so if you sit there and rehearse and i'm gonna yeah. just pick up the phone and go with your natural flow yeah. and if you mess up if you stutter if you stumble well that's just what we do anyway where yes. some people go right i'm gonna read the script hello gareth nice to see you today yeah. to talk about and it just comes across as incongruent with who you are as a person and that's then right. you look a fraud I use I use, I, I, I say the same in video with to 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 uh, is human, yeah. Because we all say, uh, but if anybody can finish the quote, I'd be quite impressed. But there we are. To forgive divine, yeah. No, it's uh, anyway. Never mind. 
nobody ever gets that because they're not on the same intellectual level I'm on. But anyway, oh, really, <laughs> oh, the same little bubble that the world I live in. Yeah, the same one, world you're on. One or the other. <laughs> but um, I should have left that open for the comment section. If you can finish the uh, quote, tell me who it's by. There we are. Yeah, if you know who that is, uh, human to forgive divine the quote is by, put it in the comment section. But Going back, yes, Chris, you are right, 100% in the fact that we we do stumble over words. We do pause to think. We do, uh, we do, um, you know, and it is a practiced art as well, though, doing a voice communication like that. You know, it does take practice. You're not going to be perfect every time. I know the first few times you're probably going to stumble slightly. But, but it perfectionism is, it, it, it's one of, I, I have a number of P's that talk about, ways that you prevent yourself from being good and perfectionism is one of those you see yeah. perfection there's a value curve between when perfection is achieved and the time <laughs> you need to get there it might be easier just to do the 90 percent and get it finished as yeah. opposed to looking for the final polish mm. because the people that are receiving your message just receive the message they don't know what your perfection looked or could have felt like it's yeah. your own personal per perfection that is preventing you god that's lots of p's isn't it uh, from being uh, yeah from being finished yeah don't let perfection override good Absolutely. see i suppose that these kind of things start to become habits shouldn't they if you're using voice messages rather than text and typing should become start habits but habits are really difficult to get you know this you 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 talk about this in in your training that you know it's difficult to form a habit and to keep doing that habit you know what are yeah. your tips for that okay well it i guess it's down to what what is a habit so a habit would be the way that you got up in the morning this morning you went to the bathroom you polished your teeth with your right hand you put the toothpaste on you turn around and there's a ritual there about the way that you are doing something and i think a, a habit first of all starts uh, with this word which i'm going to write down which is called um, an intention so you start off with an, an intention to do something so i have an intention that i'm going to be a world-class um, weight loss expert or something like that. So that's the first part of that. Uh, mm. And then you have to change something, which is that you need to start to, to lock in behavior. So in order to get to the point where you are now habit forming, you have to start to, to do the action of actually making it stick. And then it starts to become uh, the, the habit but then you have to put that into place constantly to make it a practice that's drilled in. Yeah. And then it just becomes second nature because it's automatically happening. And then it really becomes part of your attitude. So you then say, I am a 12 and a half stone, good nutritionally orientated person that values their health because I want to be alive for as many years in the future. So you connect the habit to the why, and then it becomes attitudinal, and then it becomes part of your DNA because you link it with purpose to your future. A lot of people fall off the wagon with habits because they haven't really drilled in as to why they want to do it, whether it be veganary, dry January, or the things that we might be doing at the moment. It's just something perhaps that they've locked, latched onto because they want to be better but they haven't really dialed in as to why and what the consequences are so loads of tips on habits have accountability partners have forfeits write them down share them with people stack them do one thing at a time best thing go and read atomic habits by james clear amazing book just read that book james clear atomic habits and it'll change the, the way you think about habits and also he helps you understand how to connect them in little dots so if you wanted to be a runner, put your shoes by your door when you come home from night. And the first thing you do is trip across your shoes. And you know that your shoes are reminding you that you decided that you're going to go for a run that night. And you just do little things. But your first run might only be the habit of actually lacing up your shoes, not even going for the run. But the brain's beginning to think about the fact you're now a runner as opposed to somebody that's trying to do the couch to 5K. So loads of steps. I could, I could do 90 hours on habit forming really yeah. interesting what you say you, you spoke about accountability partners a couple of times now uh, i've i've started to run um again having had quite a serious knee injury um and having probably a year off to get that right um and 
I find it very difficult to go out on my own. So I have an accountability partner. So I know that at seven o'clock on a Monday morning and a Friday morning, my partner's going to be stood outside the pub in the village. And if I'm not there, he's going to wonder where I am. So I've got to be there. So to go my 5K on twice a week, just to get back into it. So it's really interesting. Without that partner, I'd really struggle to go out on my own. Yeah. That's why Slimming World and other aspects where you're in a tribe and you're all trying to achieve more together. That's why those kind of models work, because it's not just you that you're letting down. It's also the other people. And it's useful to maybe even write a contract to yourself and share the contract with somebody else to say, I am going to do this. And if I don't do this, the consequences of that would be the X. In the coaching group I'm in, we've all had to do videos this year to say, this is my aspirational vision for this year. And if I don't do this, this is the forfeit that I'm willing to do. And I've got people talking about shaving their head, shaving their beers, getting a tattoo, all oh. kinds of forfeits that they've shared. And the consequential action is if they don't do it, there's 138 people who are going to say, you didn't do your habit, off you go, give us your consequence. A tattoo is a bit extreme. <laughs> and that's, that's, that's for if, you want, if you want to do your habit, you've got to make it hard. You know, you, there's no point saying, oh, I'm going to do something superficial or I might have to eat chocolate for a week. Well, that's not going to be... That's not going to give you a compulsion to want to go being uncomfortable, being sorry, being comfortable, being uncomfortable. Nothing good comes easy. That's very true. true. That That's very, very, true. very true. Yeah. So I tell you, 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 you in business take these messages through to sales teams. Are, that, are they sales teams from one man to 100 people or, or, you know, what's your what's your niche area, Chris? Smaller is more beneficial because I like to go really in depth on the personal aspects of where the sales team are and where their difficulties lie. So that's just my personal style, but I'll happily do one, I'll happily do 10, but I am currently working with a company that's got 30. So we've just broken down the 30 into smaller groups yeah. and they become sort of their own internal tribes within the company. But I'm a, I, I love to hear where the company's going and then try to instill my frameworks into what they're trying to achieve as opposed to just turning up and going right here's a sales framework on this and they're going well how does that link to what that we're trying to do uh, over there i suppose if you break a 30 team down into three groups of 10 you get a little bit of internal competition as well don't you within those sometimes areas? yes yeah and there's also a little bit of what have you just covered in module one and there's well, you have to wait and see, or they all see them coming out and they've, they've just done this breakthrough session and then there's automatically a little bit of uh, intrigue as to well, what's that session going to be about because they've just come out looking a little bit more fired up than when they went in. So there's some excitement there about what that's going to feel like. And you could always get the winning team. You could threaten the two losing teams with the winning team being able to tattoo the losing teams, you know, <laughs> with whatever they want. <laughs> I don't know whether the risk assessment on the health and safety team is going to sign that one off. <laughs> yeah, it would, would be interesting. I think you'd probably have a fight breakout, but there we are. Insurance brokers just go, do oh, Chris, do you know? <laughs> So, Chris, Chris, going back going to, over your years with the Dharma, as many director and director with Dharma, what, um, what's the best thing you've learned in your business? Oh, uh, fail often, fail quickly, and don't feel afraid to fail. Wow. I think if if you if you're not trying, so if you look back at last year, 2021, and if you if you if you weren't trying and therefore you didn't fail, then I'm going to challenge you to say, well, are you pushing yourself enough and you're living in complacency? And and whatever happens, when you have that world of complacency, what generally means is that you're you're going to eventually go down because everybody else is going forward. And if you're not taking action to change or innovate, then actually you'll probably find that you're no longer the freshest smell in the book and you're going to be the person that's declining. So fail often, fail quickly, but be okay with failure. Yeah, don't be afraid to fail. It's, it's not the end of the world, is it? No. no and by failing, you learn yeah. so much. So what, what happened when you were a small child? Yeah. When you got and you fell over the first time, whoever was with you, garden, parent, carer, whoever, they didn't sit there and say, ah, you, you, you can't walk, Gareth. Who do you yeah, think you, you are? Never walk. Walk. Oh. The natural desire was to get up and try again. Yeah. So yeah. when you do fail, you learn from the failure, you learn how to balance, you know how to look forward, put your foot in front of the other, and then you go again. Yeah. But the, the important thing is just to keep on trying because as humans, we have an, in, an innate word within us, which is hope. 
we hope that things will get better. And that's what differentiates us from any other species that we have a conscious mindset that says that we are aware of our self-awareness and also aware of our final days. And our final days are those that we hope that we will leave a legacy hope to others that we'll be proud of. Yeah. Too right. Very good. Too mm. right. So, so moving on to this year then, where, where, do you, where do you see yourself going in 2022? What do you want to achieve? Well, I'm actually, I, I have a very clear niche in terms of my business aspects of, of what I'm searching for. But I, I've understood that there's a little part of me that really wants to work on what I say self-improvement is a constant pursuit. And I know Gareth mentioned that. So I'm actually going to focus quite a lot on personal breakthroughs with a particular group of the population. And it is actually midlife men. I'm not saying midlife crisis, but we as, as males, I hope for anybody who's females watching will, will resonate with this, that we have our own issues with testosterone drops, metabolic decrease in, in our ability to fat burn. And that leads to some fairly big consequences so I'm actually diving into a whole new area of self-development, which is how do we live with purpose, fulfillment and future as midlife males? So I'm working a lot in that. So I'll have my midlife male mastermind group where we might do things like going for a campfire and talking about where we're at. Or we might have a beer trail and we can talk about just men talking about men stuff because, hey, let's be honest, outside of COVID, too many men make a decision that is that their life isn't worth living and they're gone yeah. or we suffer from things like prostate cancer or other things yeah. that are sometimes as a result of the way that we live so that's very very big for 2022 is to create my midlife male mastermind and deliver some benefits around that it's really yeah. interesting that chris because this this some of this used to happen 30 years ago when people came home from the work and went straight to the pub for an hour pub culture Pub yeah. culture and it yeah. was pub culture. Um, totally different. It doesn't yeah. need to be pub culture, but it's the same kind of thing. You know, it's a, it's a group yeah. of individuals getting together to talk about those things. It yeah. just like, twenty years ago, it happened in a pub. It, it was it was it was the men's stress de stress place. Was that you know like I remember my father he'd be coming home from work and if he'd had a bad day he'd stop off at the, at the rugby club have a pint with the boys and then come home. Uh, but at that time when he's having a pint with the boys, he's talking about having a moan about his boss and a moan about work and a moan about it. And it you know, didn't bring it home to us, to, to, to my mother and me and my sister, but had that moment. Like I said, it was yeah. 20, 30, 40 years ago. That's how men de-stressed a lot. A lot of the time now, is we, you know, we, we do this. Sport. And yeah, of course, now, if, yeah. if you're finding your... You, you, your release in this mm. this is the place for everybody else's comparison yeah and it's where people share the best parts of their world not the worst parts of their that's world. right and if you're looking for motivation support then social media is really the comparison of everybody else's best bits of their lives and, and you go into that and you just think well i'm not worthy i haven't got that wonderful car house relationship family joyful thing yeah this is the thing. Social media isn't a real place. It's not well, we're going to go down a real rabbit hole now, but uh... yeah, we, we could do. We could we do. Could we, do. we haven't got time to go down that. No, way, we either. haven't. But Facebook isn't a real place. You know, as you say, people go on there and they only put the best parts of their lives. They do. You know, they do. And at the end of the day, that the, then when, oh, anyway, we by going on it, we're automatically now. making choices. You know, how many times are you swiping and you're liking, you're sharing, you're liking? Your brain's going every time. It's it's deciding what you want to see and what you're not but then the algorithm then only gives you back what what, yeah. what it wants you to see exactly and it's not real because it's it's actually based on what you're already giving it and therefore it flatters your dopamine by giving you more yeah. of what you want but what you want necessarily isn't what you need yeah i've always yeah. said the algorithm in youtube for example if you watch kittens falling off shelves you'll get kittens falling off shelves if you watch depressing stuff you'll get depressing stuff um, and they, the algorithms don't understand human nature. No, I think don't. there's a shift, though. I, I do. If you look at Lush Cosmetics, for example, they've now disconnected themselves from all social because they don't think that social is relevant to their audience. Right. And I think, I think there is a bit of a swell coming back to say consumers don't like the algorithmic way that their social yeah. content is is 
creating their lives yeah. so I think, yeah I, I think i personally with things that are going on in america and stuff like that against facebook and uh, twitter and that there's going to be a decline in social media social media is going to take a hit at some point it has to because it is too it is too controlling yeah. You know? Anyway, let's move on from that. So talk about, we talk, could we could have another hour for kind of things. What what kind of what kind of apps and productivity tools do you use in your daily life? You know that would help our our viewers of uh, getting through their daily lives as well. All right, I've got uh, I've got a few here. So uh, one for the business owner, if you've not got it already, is something like Dext, which allows you to put all of your invoices and receipts onto a. Uh, on a platform and then that links to your quickbooks or to your zero so you never have to worry about paper so if you go to a coffee shop take a picture of your receipt upload that to dext and bang it's straight into your uh, accounting uh, software so that's great for me uh, if you're creating appointments for people and you want to make it efficient then calendly something like a calendly link is 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 good if you're writing a lot and you're not perfect, then Grammarly to have Grammarly in as a um, as a permanent desktop facility to make sure that you write uh, correctly. And a little bit of a controversial one is something called We Croak, uh, We C R O A K, uh, which looks at your current date of birth and then based on the time that you're expected to depart the world. It then tells you with three or four reminders a day, you now only have 36 years and four days left. Oh, that's cheery. But it, but it then gives you a motivational quote as to how to create the best purpose or the best intentions or the best things today to make today the best day it can be for you. So that's a little bit of a different one. I'm just looking this up because I try and put the links in as we go. And normally I, I'm okay with things like Calendly and stuff like that. But we croak. W -E. Find happiness by contemplating your mortality. Hey, look, we're all going to go at some stage. It's a fait accompli <laughs> that it will happen. I love it. I, I think we'll, we'll have one of our other members, Tony Carter, putting that onto everybody's app. Tony was, Tony's what, Tony was watching. <laughs> was, was, there we are. If you're still watching, Tony, right? Then, yeah, there you go. There's one for your clients. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not everybody's cup of tea, but uh, it, we all will go. Uh, it's, it's a matter of fact that some stage you will be dust. I do, I do like Grammarly. I, I have Grammarly loaded on my, on my laptop because you, you, you sometimes are typing that quickly that you just need to step back and have a look at it and Grammarly does that for you I think it's uh, I think that's a really really good tool for anybody to use that's, yeah it uh, is well. I, I use it as well I must admit there you go there's all four of them in the chat I, I use Grammarly as well and I, I like the way that it actually instead of like with your Microsoft under, underscore red line you have to right click and then choose it just drops it down and you choose it and sometimes you might not agree with it um, yeah. you know but then you don't have to make the correction yeah, there's another one called Hemingway, which is a little bit more based on are your words actually creating the intention you want? And it reads it and then it gives you a reflection back of perhaps you want to write it this way or is it really resonating with the audience and the way you intended? So Hemingway app is another one that's quite useful too. Yeah, I've used that a few yeah. times when you're posting on social just to, to make sure it's reading that a, a somebody of a level of mind can read. There you go. I put that one in as well. Yeah, it's, it's that's, that's worth a look. Yeah, definitely worth it. Brilliant. That was really good. I really enjoyed that. I mean, you know, the whole the whole chat about habits and behaviors and stuff like that is absolutely fascinating. And I mean, I must admit, Chris, I do enjoy talking to you anyway and coming on your workshops because of the fact that you you have a really good way of delivering. Um I, I, you, you like an analogy. I love an analogy. I think analogies are fantastic. I think they're the best way to describe something to people. Um, and you have a really good way of making things you know sound more effective and interesting to be honest with you so we all learn in different ways but the more you can yeah. create visual representation stories about what we're thinking about i think it then helps cement it in the yeah. emotional mind as to something that you know to be true yeah creating the story in the brain as you're going it's really Absolutely. good it's really good so thank you very much for coming that's it we're done it's been a pleasure thank you we've got Thanks, a little Chris. bit over but that's because it was a great conversation 
Um, so yeah, if anybody out there would like to come to One Hour Networking, Interactive Networking on Utopia, um, we're having a quiz tomorrow, by the way, at one to two o'clock in Utopia. That should be fun. Um, apart from that, uh, you want to be on business TV, talk about your business, then give us a shout. And thank you very much, Chris Wilson and sales coach Adamo. And brilliant. Looking forward to the next Q&A session as well, Chris. So I'll be along to that. 4th of February. 4th of February, 10 o'clock. 4th of February, my sister's yeah. birthday. And yeah. also the day that Facebook was launched, 2004. May the 4th be with you. No, that's May, isn't it? Yeah, that's sorry. Yeah. We'll, put that, we'll put that in the comments as well. Sales Q&A, 4th of February. 4th February. Well, it's my sister's well. birthday. I wouldn't. Yeah, no, there's, no need, there's no need to put it in my sister's My sister's birthday on the 4th of February as well, believe it or not. Is Honestly, it? It's mine, mine on the 3rd. Oh. Seriously. Seven years between us. There we are. Brilliant. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Thanks Gareth. Pleasure. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.